The funny thing about Stormfront, besides the fact that it has time-traveling space Nazis, is that today's part is Stormfront Part 2, but last week's is just Stormfront. Not sure if that was supposed to fake out the audience that it was a two-parter, or if it was a case of wanting to give each its own title, which would be the case with the story arcs throughout Season 4, and then they decided at the last minute to make the link more obvious. In any case, I've labeled the first Part 1 to try to avoid confusion. So, we've established that this is time travel scenario number 18, Nazis winning World War II. But the natural question is, how are they pulling it off this time? There's as many ways the Nazis can win as there are time travelers heading back to try and fail to kill Hitler. Our heroes watch footage of De Fuhrer himself in New York City to admire their foothold in North America. Impressively doctored from Hitler's visit to Paris, as well as footage of an actual Nazi rally held in New York City although Hitler didn't show up for that personally because, of course, New York City had been invaded by Daleks and he didn't want to settle for being the second most evil force in the city. After the titles, in the entirely too White House, we find the Nazi in charge, Commandant Monocle von Wienerschnitzel. He's complaining to Vosk, head of time-traveling space Nazis, about the pending American counterattack. They're learning the hard way, as anyone who's played Civilization will tell you. Getting your army onto the other side of the ocean is hard and North America is kind of incredibly huge. To win, they're going to need some of that fancy alien tech that Vosk is always promising but never delivering, like the gun we saw last time that would annihilate any ground attack if they just had enough power to actually fire it. Now there's a brand new wing of fighters that reports say are ready for deployment, but Vosk insists are still being developed. He, of course, has zero interest in this conflict. Voss could give the Nazi super weapons with a clear conscience, maybe if he had one, but he's not. Why? As he'll say later on, he's concerned that the Nazis are going to wind up using those weapons against him. And so he's just going to keep stringing them along to get what he needs, the technology to build a portal to get back to his own time. But he's also not going to take any shit and says that if the Nazis won't help, he'll go work with the Allies then. Should have you arrested for treason? You are a fool. You think we are equals because I allow you to participate in this struggle. You fight to control nations. We dominate entire worlds. Yeah, Nazis can't really compare to interplanetary conquerors considering they, well, failed to conquer even a single planet. Still, you have to concede, there's not many countries that say, I'm going to declare war on everyone else in the world, lose, and then say, best two out of three. The next time you feel the urge to threaten me, remember this. I can erase you from history as if you never existed. Oh, are you going to cry, huh? Huh? Is the Nazi going to cry? Up on Enterprise, Alicia is trying to take all this in. Aliens, time travel, spaceships, matter transport. It's a hell of a thing to be dropped into when your every thought has been surviving under goons who want you exterminated. But Alicia's tough. Whatever other shit is going on, she's resisting the Nazi occupation of her neighborhood. So when Archer offers to drop her off someplace safe, she insists the only place she wants to go is back home to fight the good fight. And she wants Archer to join in that fight. And admittedly, an orbiting spaceship is a pretty potent weapon against an army that's primary means of moving its artillery is the horse. But Archer says there's a better way to win this war than by completely wiping out Berlin and every other city with Germans in it. The time travel plot that will unravel the change to history is better than exterminating the Germans because, you know, we'd like to kind of keep genocide never solved anything on our list of truisms. Also, she's just learned that to get back, they have to beam down. Metal pods are damaged. The transporter is all we have. Archer, you promised me I wouldn't have to go through that again. Well, what the hell do you want him to do about it? They're broken. Is he supposed to pull a working shuttle out of his ass on command? This isn't Voyager. It's either transport or hold your breath and jump. Pick one. Meanwhile, Vosk is running another test on their portal. That was even better than the last test. They've also figured out that Tucker and Travis aren't temporal agents, but could be useful bargaining chips. Return the prisoners to their holding cell. See that they get medical attention.
bring the doctor. Oh, a Nazi doctor, that's comforting, said no one ever. Meanwhile, Reed has found the answer to Nazi takeover. It wasn't thanks to alien weapons, but alien manipulation of time. Someone assassinated Lenin in 1916. Those alien bastards killed John Lennon? No, that's actually... Did they just kill him or the rest of the Beatles, too? Captain, I'm talking about Vladimir Lenin. Vlad Lenin? Oh, my God. Yes, you see, they turned the Beatles into vampires. No wonder the Nazis are winning. Aliens and vampires. And they're German, so they've got to have a Frankenstein, too. It's hopeless. Reed explains that without Lenin, there was no successful communist revolution in Russia. The reasoning is, is that fascism and communism are the two greatest enemies of each other, even more so than a democratic capitalist society is to either one, which is why Hitler broke the treaty with Stalin and launched an eastern campaign that weakened their war effort. Without the massive Soviet buildup or the existential threat a communist neighbor represents, they were free to devote all their forces to heading west. This allowed a conquest of all of Europe and an expansion into the United States, which seems to now be overextended, but none of it will matter if they stop Vosk. Doing that will then prevent the war, the temporal war, from beginning in the first place, setting everything back to normal. In other words, even if Archer decided to drop bombs on Berlin, it wouldn't make a difference unless they failed to stop the temporal war, in which case victory over the Nazis doesn't mean much when you've got genocidal time puppeteers dominating the universe. I mean, you do need to have a sense of perspective. Anyway, Archer and Vosk arrange a meeting in relatively neutral surroundings to discuss things, including turning over Trip and Mayweather, in exchange for information on what Archer's doing here. Archer complies, revealing that they're here at the behest of Daniel's faction, which Vosk dismisses as a corrupt force that seeks to manipulate history for their own ends while denying other factions to do the same. He says Archer should work with him instead. He's only working with the Nazis for access to tech. If he can use Archer's instead, then they can get back, restore Archer's original timeline, and send Enterprise back to its own time. And if you can't trust a man wearing an SS uniform, by God, who can you trust? Archer returns to Enterprise, where he debriefs Trip and Mayweather during their physicals, which reveals that Trip isn't Trip at all. He's been replaced by Silic. He's tossed in a cell for questioning, first about the disc Silic had on him, detailed plans for Vosk's base in Nazi land. Archer thinks the future guy figured out that the temporal agents were sending Enterprise into the past, and so sent Silic to infiltrate the ship so he could get these plans and allow Future Guy to travel bodily into the past, instead of just his low bandwidth image. Back in Brooklyn, Alicia's trying to help Carmine, the muscle for the now-dead mobster. When the soldiers courted you and Archer, you two disappeared into thin air, like ghosts. It's crazy. That's what I said. But then again, I didn't believe in Nazi Martians, you know, not until I saw one myself. Ah, red flag? Red Planet, yeah, the answer was staring us in the face the whole time. Voss calls up Archer to complain about the stolen data, and Archer admits what Silic did, but says he has no interest in giving it back, or of working with Vosk. So Vosk pulls out a plasma cannon to shoot Enterprise down, complete with a couple swastikas on it. I don't think anyone actually painted them on there. I think that swastikas just grow on things like mold once a Nazi has touched it. Enterprise escapes, though it's badly damaged, so Archer decides he and Silic will infiltrate Vosk's base. Tucker's still in there, remember, and they need to complete this mission, which Silic can get behind since Vosk's faction is no friend of theirs. This is war, and while Archer and Silic may not see eye to eye on most things, Archer isn't going to exterminate the Sulevan. Well, not deliberately, anyway. As Silic soon explains, Vosk is indeed the most dangerous faction. His people nearly wiped out the Sulevan preventing their emergence as a sapient species. And it was the temporal agents who stopped Vosk. They're still fighting the agents, but it's probably why Silic is more inclined to work with Archer than do nothing. Archer's an ally of an enemy that fights with Marcus of Queensbury rules. Back in the compound, Vosk gets a visit from Commandant Gustav von Schnitzelbank with a signed order from Hitler himself to turn over the Super Squadron to the Luftwaffe so it can be used against the American forces that are advancing on their borders. Voss says that it'll be ready in six hours, but plans to be gone before then. 
Sure, no conduit has ever worked, but when you're in a Nazi bunker, how can you not be optimistic? Archer and Silic, who is in disguise as a human, hook up with Alicia and Carmine to try to get resistance help in an attack on Voss' compound. Carmine and Silic get along like Rush Limbaugh and Ed Schultz stuck in the same elevator, but Alicia is in, so Carmine grudgingly goes along with it. Fortunately, the place isn't very well guarded. There are multiple attacks by large armies, after all, so it's no surprise that the forces might be a bit thinner than what it would normally be. Plus, Archer is going in armed with a ray gun and a person that can fit through a mail slot. That probably wasn't figured into the defenses. They slip in and deactivate the shield surrounding the base. Yep, there's a shield protecting them from orbital bombardment. Vosk is thorough. So Enterprise can now fly in and blow them up. The problem is, though, damage was so great to Enterprise that their targeting system has been knocked out. So they have to fly in close to try to shoot it. And Enterprise wasn't exactly built for atmosphere. Hmm, maybe the air holes blown into it will make it go faster. Down in the bunker, Silic, disappointed that he doesn't have a weapon, decides to attack a few guards unarmed. He does take down two before he gets shot in the back while sauntering away. He dies, calling Archer a worthy opponent. And I can't disagree, Silic never impressed me either. During that fun, Tucker had rescued himself, and after nearly blowing away Archer thinking that he was a disguised Silic, they're ready to make a daring escape before Enterprise blows this place up. If they survive, of course, because Vosk has gunned down Commandant Schnauzer von Goddardammerung and instead sent out those superplanes to attack the Enterprise directly, and it's firing plasma weapons instead of bullets. But, eye on the prize time. They head for the bunker, even as Vosk's people form a stable conduit, and with a few well-placed torpedoes, end his plans for eternal domination. And thanks to that, there will never be a Nazi in America, ever. Archer finds himself in the corridors of time, or whatever the hell this is, where Daniels assures him that he set things right. And thanks to him, this whole temporal Cold War subplot is over. Finally, Archer has actually done something worthy of being a hero. They're returning to their own time, to a waiting fleet and music of triumph. It's like the ending of Voyager, except we'll actually have time for a coda this time. The post-episode follow-up. Annoying character goes to CGI White House for pulling us right out of the story with something that looks like a Civilization VI cutscene. We have a Lazarus of the Week for Daniels, killed by messed up time effects, but restored by messed up time effects. No word on Silic, so we'll have to wait and see with him. All scores are relative to their series. Final score for Stormfront thus is... 6 out of 10. It's above average as far as Enterprise goes, but it's a rather lackluster story overall, having little energy driving the narrative and struggling with any sense of atmosphere. It feels exactly like what you would expect from an episode with this premise. And while I don't think Manny Cotto phoned it in, I have a feeling his heart really wasn't in this one. One thing it does do is, for the first time, make me interested in the temporal Cold War, moving it beyond the indirect and serving the plot of the weak stuff to have a sense that it was a truly wondrous and terrifying thing that was happening. That seems more like the vibe I'm getting off it. Coda was more interested in exploring that than dealing with the aliens help Nazis plot that he was stuck with. If you're not sick of war by now, it takes a new form next week as we return to the original series. It's A Taste of Armageddon. Right. Hey, get the man a prize. Why would you do that? I'm going to kill this guy. Hey.